All right, this is the crash course in teaching diagnostic reasoning. This is part four in illness scripts. So we're gonna start with a non-medical example. I'm gonna ask you three questions. First, when you go to any restaurant, what do you expect to happen? Well, what do you expect to happen? You expect that you're gonna walk in, somehow you're gonna end up seated probably. You're going to eat the food after you've ordered it, and after you've eaten it, you're gonna pay for it and you're going to leave. That is the most generic script for what happens in a restaurant. Second question, what about a fancy restaurant? Well, you're going to have a little bit more specific of a script for that, right? You're going to walk in. There's probably going to be a host or a hostess. You're going to be seated. When you're seated, there's probably going to be several different people that you encounter. Somebody's going to pour your water for you. Somebody else is going to take your order. Somebody else might bring out your bread. There might even be a fourth person who comes out to scrape uh, the crumbs off the bread, of the bread off the table into some sort of contraption. There's going to be an expert in how to pair wine with the, you know, the meal you're having. You're going to place your order you're probably not gonna go stand up and pay for it at a register, but they're gonna take your bill, uh, or they're gonna pay your, for your bill at the table. They're gonna bring you a dessert menu, you're not gonna have to ask for it. That's what happens at a fancy restaurant, right? All right, third question. What do you remember about the fanciest restaurant you ever visited? Well, you might remember some very vivid details about that, right? That's a very specific example of a time you visited a fancy restaurant. Well, we can see the same thing will happen with diseases when we think about them, right? So how does pneumonia present? Well, if you're like me and you've been trained in internal medicine, you know that it can present in so many different ways. I've seen lots of patients with pneumonia now, and they really it's really hard to say there's one very prototypical presentation. Now, what if I say, how about atypical bacterial walking pneumonia? How does that present? Well, there I have a little bit more of a specific illness script. Usually young people, they're ambulatory, they have high fevers, they have diffuse crackles, they have diffuse interstitial infiltrates and imaging. That would be like a prototype of an atypical bacterial walking pneumonia. All right, and what was the most unusual presentation of you can recall? We all have these highly memorable cases that shape how we think about diseases that we cannot ignore, right? These are like the fanciest restaurant we've ever visited. So you'll see here that all of these patients have what is probably pneumonia, right? They are very different patients, but they still fit the pneumonia script. A young patient with one week of high fevers, productive cough, diffuse crackles. An old man with previous CVA and dysphagia now with lethargy, leukocytosis, and bibasal infiltrates. A middle-aged woman with multiple myeloma who's had a bone marrow transplant, now with neutropenic fevers, tachypnea, and scattered ground glass opacities on a chest CT that we're not seeing on an x-ray. Or a young man with sickle cell disease presenting with a pain crisis and hypoxemia who develops an infiltrate and pleural effusion in the hospital. These are all pneumonia, right? But they're all a little bit different, right? They're, the script here is not the same at all, and that's because there are subtypes of pneumonia that have more specific illness scripts. So what exactly are scripts? They are memory shortcuts built upon highly organized knowledge structures. And if we think about the restaurant example, I think there are three levels of scripts. There's a syndromic script, which is if I walk into any restaurant, what do I expect to happen? There's an illness script, which is what happens in the fancy restaurant. And then there's a script instantiation. When I actually go to visit a fancy restaurant, what is going to happen that night? Or the time I visited the fanciest restaurant I can ever remember going to, what happened that night? Those are what instances, that's instantiation of the script. So when we talk about illness scripts, we're talking about the same thing. Illness scripts are mental file folders that are long to memory that hold what we know about disease. Now they're file folders, and in there we might have subfolders, we might have different files, right? So illness scripts are initially built from prototypes. When we're learning clinical medicine, we learn about a prototypical patient with pneumonia fever, productive cough, chest uh, imaging was going to show an infiltrate, right? And we start to refine those prototypes with experience, though. So again, I've seen lots of different variations and presentations of pneumonia. That's going to change how I think about pneumonia. And ultimately, it's going to be con clinician-specific, context-specific, right? I'm an intensivist. I see different flavors of pneumonia than an outpatient primary care doctor is going to be seen. So when learners are forming illness scripts, they're going to start as early learners that think of illnesses as classic presentations and buzzwords. And that's okay, those are some of the foundations of an illness script. But with experience, the experienced clinician starts to develop richer scripts. They add to it. They recognize subtle variations. They start to develop tolerance for atypical presentations. Now before we move any further, I just want to give a warning here. Script theory explains how clinicians reason, but it is not a prescription for how to reason. So when Custers was writing up this stuff on script theory some 20, 30 years ago, it was really meant to be a description of how expert clinicians reason. We've now used it to te teach uh, learners how to think about cases, right? What, what is the illness script? How does the illness script for uh, that disease align with the current patient's presentation?
but initially was really just meant to be a way to describe how clinicians think. So let's look at some of the theoretical uh, considerations of uh, illness scripts and script selection. So when we're seeing a patient, new patient, new complaint, we're getting all this visual auditory input, data's coming in, and again, we might recognize a pattern. That's system one thinking, right? There's a gut feeling, there's intuition about the case, and that gut feeling or intuition relates to the previous instances of that disease that we've seen or read about. So if I see somebody coming in and they're complaining of dyspnea, well, I might get a little bit more information. They tell me they have hemoptysis and they, oh, by the way, they had a recent orthopedic injury and have been off their feet for the last two weeks. Well, that suddenly is invoking my illness script for uh, pneumonia, for pulmonary embolism uh, deep in my brain. Now, I might use some system two thinking and start actively comparing and contrasting diagnostic possibilities. So I might ask about pneumonia symptoms to make sure that my illness script for pneumonia is not going to be activated more than my illness script for pulmonary embolism. And all that's going to occur in my working memory. I'm going to be juggling a limited number of data, and I'm going to be testing those data points against the illness script stored in my brain. Now, if I don't recognize the pattern, I'm going to be using a lot of system two thinking up front. I'm going to be searching for additional data that will ultimately activate the scripts. And suddenly some patterns will start to emerge. And I may not have a perfect pattern for a single specific disease. I may not recognize this as peptic ulcer disease, but at least I start to recognize this is a dyspepsia script. And I'm going to have to start looking for different illnesses that will, you know, incorporate the dyspepsia. So when we talk about what goes into an illness script, this is, the, again, a description of how uh, experts reason. Experts think about diseases in three ways. They think about the context or the enabling conditions that cause the disease to even develop. So for an acute myocardial infarction, that's going to be the risk factors, right? Smoking. It's going to be a dyslipidemic patient. They're going to be a little bit older. You know, they're not going to usually be young people. Then we think about the fault or biological process that underpins that disease. So with acute myocardial infarction, it's a plaque, plaque rupture leading to platelet aggregation, ultimately leading to myocardial ischemia. And then we're going to think about consequences. So there's going to be EKG changes, there's going to be pain, there's going to be dyspnea, there's going to be diaphoresis. Well, practically, when we're uh, you know, teaching about this stuff, we're going to start to use a little bit different terminology. So components of an illness script would include the epidemiology of the disease, the pathophysiology, the time course, the salient signs and symptoms, the findings and diagnostic tests, and the expected response to treatment. And as you can see, these align with the sort of theoretical three major components of an illness script, the context, the fault, and the consequences. Now, I've given an example here of diverticular bleeding. Uh, this is my script for diverticular bleeding. I wrote this off the top of my head. Um, and as you can see, it's actually fairly robust. There's a lot of things that go into it. Now, I've seen patients across the spectrum. I used to do primary care before I went back to critical care fellowship. So I've seen patients with diverticular bleeding that had a very you know, single self-limited episode of bright red blood per rectum. And I've also had patients I had to send to surgery for a colectomy because the bleeding just would not stop. So uh, that's why my illness script is, sort of has its wide tolerance to how these patients present. Now, this actually aligns with some of the stuff we've already talked about, too. We talk about problem representation. And the components of problem representation, we say that entails who the patient is, the acuity and time course of illness, and the key features of the case. When we ask learners to give a summary statement, that's what we want them to do, right? Tell me who the patient is, what's the acuity and time course, and what are the key features? And one of the reasons we do that is because that will start to align with illness scripts. In fact, those align perfectly with the clinical components of an illness script. Now, how do scripts help with differential diagnosis? Fundamentally, I'd say prior, prioritizing differential diagnoses relies on how well the patient's presentation matches the illness script. There's more that goes into diagnosis, but at its simplest, that's what a prioritizing a differential diagnosis is all about. So if I have a patient with epigastric pain, I can ask my learners to think about what might some common causes be, and they might list things like peptic ulcer disease, pancreatitis, aortic dissection. But we might be seeing a patient who actually has some specific things that we're going to invoke one script or, the, or another. So let's say this is a middle-aged person. They have alcohol use disorder. Well, now I'm going, to start be, I'm going to be thinking about my peptic ulcer disease and my pancreatitis scripts a little bit more than my aortic dissection because alcohol use is a risk factor for those first two diseases. Now let's hear, we hear that the patient has a subacute to chronic time course. They've been having epigastric pain on and off for several weeks. That's really going to start to activate my peptic ulcer disease script a lot more than my acute pancreatitis or my aortic dissection. They tell me that there's no radiation in the pain. Well, when I hear about acute pancreatitis or aortic dissection, I'm often looking for pain radiating to the back. It's common in those scenarios. But the absence of radiation to the pain is still going to make me think more about peptic ulcer disease. Then we might start looking at diagnostic tests, right? So if I was thinking that this might have been acute pancreatitis or might have been an aortic dissection, 
and the learner tells me now that the CT is negative, or I tell the learner the CT is negative, they really need to start moving away from these illness scripts, right? These are key features, right? We would absolutely expect to find some CT findings of these things if we're really considering these diagnoses. Now you might say, well, some pancreatitis early on may not have CT findings. And you're right, it's not always the case. But then I'd still expect to find an elevated lipase. So there's still some other key diagnostic test that is going to be required to really stay on script for that illness. We can do this with another scenario too, right? So again, fundamentally, a lot of diagnostic reasoning is seeing how well the patient's presentation matches with an illness script. So if I have somebody presenting in clinic with lower extremity edema, well, I'm going to start looking for some key features that are going to help me differentiate venous stasis from heart failure. And that might be because I have some shared epidemiology up here. It's hard to know what the pathophysiology is in any given patient. But if the patient has diurnal waxing and waning pattern of their lower extremity edema, that's going to make me think more about venous stasis. However, if they have signs of elevated cardiac filling pressure or they have classic Framingham symptoms of orthopnea and PND, then I really need to be looking at my heart failure. That's a really characteristic finding in that illness script. When people talk about illness scripts, one of the things they don't necessarily think about is an, another line we might add to what goes into an illness script, and that's uh, variations that make the diagnosis difficult. And I think this is important to reflect on, particularly with advanced learners, because this is the area for greatest growth with clinical experience and the most opportunities to reflect. So I've put up here a couple common diagnoses that I see that often mimic one another, bacterial pneumonia and heart failure. And I've put here some of the variations that over time I've learned to recognize that make the diagnosis difficult. In my heart failure patients, I've often been fooled by obese patients that hide their volume well. They're hypervolemic, you just can't see it. Or they have a normal pro-BMP. Or they have a reportedly normal echo, and that's because they have mostly diastolic dysfunction. I've also been fooled with pneumonia patients, those that don't have a fever or a white count. Or the chest radiograph was negative early in the course of disease. And these, are start, these start to become the subtle variations uh, that I need to start to recognize, particularly for common diseases. All right, again, I'll put this warning out here. Script theory is a way, sorry, explains how clinicians reason, but it is not a prescription for how to reason. So it is helpful to think about teaching diagnostic reasoning through the lens of scripts, but there are some limitations to script-based reasoning, and we're going to see those now. The first are knowledge gaps. Those are your own knowledge gaps as well as the knowledge gaps in your, in your learners. Now, they may be missing knowledge or they may be incorrect knowledge. So if you have learners that are looking for and anticipating a Koenig sign when they're evaluating patients with suspected bacterial meningitis, well, they're kind of screwing themselves. The likely ratio of a, of a Koenig sign, both the positive and negative likely ratios, are really poor. So that's something that they may have put in their illness script because they were told that's part of the prototype. But as you see in clinical medicine, that's really not a helpful part of the illness script and not something they necessarily need to be looking for. Similarly, early clinical learners might have memorized a pentad for TTP, fever, anemia, thrombocytopenia, altered mental status, and renal failure. And they might start to invoke TTP because they feel like that illness script has been activated when they see patients with that pentad. But they're often not thinking about the other risk factors, the pathophysiology or the other key features that would help distinguish TTP. So in my ICU, I see patients with that pentad all the time, and almost none of them have TTP. They usually just have sepsis. Sepsis has all the same things, right? So um, I know that I'm not invoking my TTP illness script because I know more about the risk factors and pathophysiology. I know there are other key features that need to be looking for, like abundant schistocytes on the smear, or an LDH through the roof, or raging, you know, uh, raging homolysis, I knew the word would come to me eventually, raging homolysis, right? And if these things aren't present, I'm not going to be even, my CTP script is not even going to be activated. So clearly, if I have knowledge gaps, I can't do script-based reasoning well. The next limitation of script-based reasoning are cognitive biases. We're going to talk about these a little bit more in a dedicated talk on biases, but some of these become very relevant when we're thinking about reasoning with scripts alone. So availability is a big one. I once saw a case of myocardial infarction present with diarrhea. I haven't seen that, but somebody might say something like that. And that's availability bias, right? That's not a prototype. That's nothing to do. That's totally atypical. Now, it's possible that somebody has seen somebody present with myocardial infarction uh, who presented with diarrhea, but that's not a common way to think about it. But that might creep into my... Uh, into my working memory as I'm starting to see patients with diarrhea. I'm like, oh, I'm, maybe I should be thinking about acute myocardial infarction. I once saw somebody like that. Well, that's called availability bias. And that's going to more often take me down the wrong path than the right path. Similarly, confirmation bias comes into play when I'm doing script-based reasoning. So if I see a 42-year-old multiparous obese woman who has nausea and vomiting and somebody's already got a bunch of labs in her and I see she's got an elevated AST, ALT, ALKFAS, and Billy, uh, my illness script for acute cholecystitis has been activated. And I might only look for confirming evidence after that to find that she has cholecystitis. And I might not recognize, hold on a second, she never told me she had pain. 
and I start to miss that, that should be part of the illness script too, right? So then I only start to look for things that are going to support the illness script that was activated early on and not necessarily look for other things that are going to activate other illness scripts. Which gets at this concept that Dan Kahneman in um, his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, talks about what you see is all that there is, or wasiati. I think that's the way you pronounce it. So, you know, illness scripts uh, are a convenient way to think about disease, and they often get activated very early when we're evaluating a patient. But if we're not looking for disconfirming evidence, evidence to, con to the contrary of the first script that comes to mind, then we're going to get stuck, right? Or, and we're going to miss diagnoses. One of the other major limitations of script-based reasoning is uh, when we have extremes of disease presentation. And here are the things that I think fit into that mold. A common disease with a highly variable presentation. The illness script for myocardial infarction, for pneumonia, for me now is, is so variable, it's almost unhelpful for me to talk about it with learners, right? I have common diseases that present so, with such great variability and such highly typical and atypical presentations that it's difficult to have a unifying illness script for these. Similarly, we have mass graders in medicine, right? And it's kind of hard to teach around illness scripts when diseases can present in so many different ways. TB, amyloidosis, syphilis, celiac disease. Now, we might think about all the various iterations of scripts that would align with these diagnoses, but it's hard to ask learners to describe a prototypical way that something like syphilis presents with. Well, you might have a prototype, right? But it can also be a mass grader that's going to present in so many different ways. Finally, Hickam's dictum is uh, another major limitation of script-based reasoning. And Hickam's dictum is simply that patients can have multiple disease processes at once. So if we're trying to align all of their sign and symptoms into a single illness because of parsimony, because we want an illness script to fit, we might not recognize that we actually should be looking at multiple simultaneous illness scripts and simultaneous instantiations of a disease in a single patient. Some patients are so complex that they're entitled to have multiple diseases at the same time. And using solely just uh, script-based reasoning sometimes is not going to allow us to make that recognition.